Hello. Welcome to the Ancestry Extra webinar, Finding Susan, with me, Linda Yip of Past Presence. Today, we're going to be exploring Chinese genealogy on ancestry. I am a member of the Ancestry Canada Board of Genealogists. I'm a genealogist, a writer, a speaker, and a blogger on my site, Past Presence. Uh, I've uh, spoken on using Evernote for genealogy because I'm also very um, intrigued by organizing genealogical records, uh, and I've spoken on Chinese genealogy as well. Uh, last fall, I joined the Heritage of Cantonese Migration Tour with Dr. Henry Yu, Dr. Celia Tan, great group of people, and we went to Say Yup, which is my Yup ancestral home village. And we did that in October uh, last year. And then a few months later, I was uh, privileged to join the group of uh, Chinese ancestry at um, the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy uh, with uh, Kelly Summers and her amazing team. So, welcome to my webinar. Today, we are talking about uh, my five tips for Chinese genealogy. And uh, then we will uh, look at a case study of um, my Aunt Susan. Then we'll analyze the clues that we are finding from that. And then we'll recap and look at the resources. So literally, this was a Chinese proverb. I like to start with a quote. And this one seemed particularly apropos. To forget one's ancestors is to be a brook without a source, a tree without a root. So my first tip for Chinese genealogy is to collect all the names. Uh, certainly, you want your surnames um, in English and in Chinese. Uh, all the variations, all the spellings. Uh, a lot of the older census records for Chinese, the people who were responding to the questions misunderstood because they were asked by what name are you called? And the answer was, um, well, I'm called, uh, I think, uh, my great grandfather may have been called A Sang. And as a result, there are um, thousands upon thousands of uh, Chinese men on census records without their formal name, but rather the name by which they were called. So uh, family names, usual names, variations of names, married names, both men and women have, uh, may have had uh, a formal married name, uh, a natal name, that's a name given at birth, uh, nicknames, aliases, titles, and uh, if you don't have a Chinese name, a name in Chinese, uh, there's a couple ways to get it. One is grave markers and another is something we're going to be covering today. Like a CI9 certificate where you might be able to find a Chinese name. My second tip is uh, getting started in immigration records. Now, uh, to find your ancestors' immigration records, you'll need uh, a port of entry and a year. And one of the places that you can find that information is to find them on the census records. Now, not every Canadian census record has immigration information. Uh, in my case, I'm very fortunate because Yip Sang had, uh, I was able to, I'm able to find four census records uh, for him. Uh, 1891, 1901, 1911 and 1921. But not all census uh, documents are the same. As you can see here, uh, you'll only find immigration and naturalization information on 1901 and 1911 
And uh, if you have more than one census record, I recommend that you collect the information from all of them because the information is not necessarily the same or accurate or right, but at least they point you in the right direction. It really depends on whoever was answering the question. Now, naturalization records uh, for the Chinese, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't often granted to uh, the Chinese. Just a few successful businessmen. Yip Sang was one of them, uh, but uh, immigration is the date that you're looking for. Immigration and that'll help you narrow down some documents. My third tip is to treat immigration and travel like the same thing, even though we think of them as very different things. Now, the Chinese Immigration Act of 1885 and 1947, you may have heard of that. Uh, true, uh, there, it uh, is the reason why the head taxes existed, but it, for our purposes, it's where we will be getting the Chinese Immigration uh, Nine certificates. Another thing that's quite important is to know what kind of transport your ancestors used when they uh, left the country. Was it by rail? Was it by ship or car? And a, a great site to be looking at for the Chinese Immigration Act certificates is the Vancouver Public Library. They have a fantastic breakdown of all the Chinese immigration certificates. Uh, here are some of the main ones. And under other certificates are, you know, a huge number of listings. Now I draw your attention here to a CI-10 because I recently found a CI-10 for my own great-grandfather, Yip Sang. Okay, so the other uh, uh, major group of uh, interrelated laws uh, had to do with the Chinese Exclusion Act in the United States. Roughly 1882 to 1943, uh, and these two bodies of laws, the Immigration Act and the Exclusion Act, governed uh, all the movements for the Chinese. And something I want to point out here is if your person um, crossed a border for any reason whatsoever, they went for the weekend, they wanted to go shopping, uh, they, uh, any reason, there may be a Chinese Exclusion Act case file for you to find. Now you will find those records at the National Archives at Seattle. Unfortunately, the archives are currently closed, but if you write to them and give them all the information that you have on your ancestor and their movements, you know, whether they, when they went across, um, what port, uh, what date, you know, what their name was on the records, the more information you can give them, the easier it will be for them to find the Exclusion Act records. And as for why you might want to see those, we will get to that in this presentation. My fourth tip is uh, cluster research or the fan club. Uh, now, that term, the fan club, uh, is attributed to Elizabeth Schoen Mills for friends, associates, and neighbors. And um, it could be anyone. It could be uh, business associates. It, it could be tennis club. It could be soccer club. It, uh, at Tongs, family associations. And the other part of this is social capital. So. When we went to uh, China, uh, we learned about Chinese social capital, which is the method that uh, the Chinese diaspora thinks about when connecting to other um, people. If you wanted a son uh, for your daughter, 
a, a, a husband for your daughter or a, you wanted a job or you wanted to know where the best barbecue pork was or you um, wanted um, to buy some furniture, you, you wouldn't necessarily step out of you know your social circle. You would ask a friend of a friend of a friend for a referral and and so you put these two things together, um, the fan club idea, friends, associates, and neighbors, with the Chinese social capital, and you get a group of people, the Chinese, who are particularly um, intertwined with one another. And so if you find one associate, you, might, you may very well find more. My fifth tip, is uh, pay attention to important dates in history. I've mentioned already the Exclusion Act and the Chinese Immigration Act. Uh, another one I'd like to point out here is the Electoral Franchise Act, which in Canada disenfranchised the Chinese. Um, uh, that is to say, it took the vote away. The Chinese in Canada had the vote before 1885, and the vote wasn't restored after much work by many people, uh, the topic of which uh, I'm very interested in, but it's too much for this presentation, uh, was regained, the Chinese that regained the vote um, in 1947 and went to the polls in 1949. So, for example, that means that there won't be any voters lists for Chinese between 1885 and 1949. Uh, another way of looking at important dates in uh, Chinese Canadian history uh, was a tip that I found through um, reading a blog by uh, Seattle archivist and uh, genealogist Trish Hackett Nicola. Uh, she wrote a blog about uh, the Chinese who attended the Alaska Yukon Pacific Expo, which was a very big deal in 1909. Chinese up and down the western coast uh, from BC, well obviously Alaska, straight on down through California, came to Seattle to see the Chinese village at the expo. And the reason why I bring this up is because my great grandfather attended this and there is a Chinese Exclusion Act case file because he attended an expo. So I'll get back to that again later. Now, who are we talking about today? Uh, we're talking about uh, Susan, Susan Yip Gimling. But before we can talk about Susan, let's talk about her father, Yip Sang. Now, if you've heard of Yip Sang, you've probably heard um, prominent businessman, uh, 23 kids, uh, four wives, and that's true. But what you may not have heard is that he was also a philanthropist. He uh, donated great big gobs of money to uh, St. Joseph's Oriental Hospital in Vancouver, for example, and uh, to found a school, um, the Taishan a number one school in uh, Taishan, Guangdong in China. And I got to stand at the foot of the plaque honoring my great grandfather at that school. And it was an incredibly special moment. He was also a political activist. He uh, argued uh, on behalf of the voiceless, the Chinese community, and a member of um, the Chinese Nationalist League and a few other things. But So he had 19 sons and four daughters, and Yip Gim Ling was the youngest of his four daughters. As you can see, she was uh, an accomplished woman in her own right. And in this webinar, I'd like to uh, show you some of her, move, her movements. So if I weren't related to her, I would have Googled her. And in fact, I did Google her. And this is what came up. Uh, Suzanne, a uh, Chinese Canadian woman, studied at a Canadian university. And then she went to Columbia University. So that's interesting. I then went to uh, newspapers.com. I have a subscription to Publishers Extra. Uh, I, I gave newspapers.com um, a trial when they had their free weekend in June, uh, and I was addicted. I, in three days, I got 300 articles 
about my family. If you have a family who is located in any of the cities that newspapers has papers for, I strongly recommend that you try it out. So I found this article uh, by searching for, uh, well, actually not her name, but on Wednesday, April 26, 1933, uh, in the Society pages, there's an article, Vancouver-born Chinese woman educationist here from Canton. So I read the entire article, and this is what I pulled out of it. Uh, notice I didn't use her name. Uh, it's Yip and Vancouver. And uh, some facts, uh, where she went to school, uh, and then some educational history. I took all of these facts and more from the article and I put them in my tree in Ancestry. But for us, I'd like to point out these facts specifically. In April, roughly April 1933, she traveled from China to Canada. In 1919, she traveled from Canada to the United States and possibly in 1922 would have returned from the United States to Canada. In 1923, she traveled from Canada to China. And in 33, uh, came from China to Canada and then returned six months later. So here, let me. So this gives us three different uh, sets of dates to look for immigration and travel and uh, three clues. Because remember, thanks to the Chinese Immigration Act and the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese needed documents to leave the country, they needed documents to enter a country, and they needed documents to leave a country and have the right to come back to the country. So there are many documents to find for immigration and travel. So now we're going to search the records in Ancestry. We're going to look at the Canadian passenger lists, the border crossings, and North Dakota and Washington, Chinese passenger arrivals and dispositions. Let's have a look at the Canadian passenger list. I like to go directly to the database uh, as opposed to the general search. And let's type in this information. We think that she arrived in April, 1933, thanks to the newspaper article. We'll assume that she came to Vancouver and search. Now notice our top hits show people arriving in April 1933, but both under the same name. We know that Susan's husband's name is Chick Wai Lung, so it is extremely possible that one of these two people with the same name arriving on the same day are the person that we're looking for. Now when we go to the record, we see in brackets that Kim Ling which is Susan's alternate name, is here. And let me show you the record. Yep, here we are. It says passengers embarked at Hong Kong, China, 17th March, 1933, and number five and oh, six and seven are Susan and her son, Victor, and her son, Washington. So normally I would save this both to my tree and I would also capture the citation information here and I would save a copy via download to my desktop for my files. I would also take apart all the information and analyze it. 
Now I'd like to give you an example of results from U.S. border crossings from Canada to the United States. We know from the newspaper article that Susan attended Columbia University. Now it didn't say what year she attended, but I did some quick math and I assumed that her arrival would have been a couple of years after she graduated high school. In this case, I don't know where she crossed the border, so I will leave that blank. And here, the second record, you can hover over the view record to quickly check before hitting it. And it looks pretty promising. And then to see the record, this is the page that comes up. Notice that the top of the page says, list or manifest of alien passengers applying for admission, and the sentence is cut off. This is a clue that there's another page. To the United States from foreign contiguous territory, such as Canada and Mexico, and also that the page is still cut off. So you can see on the third page, there is some pretty valuable information. In fact, the exact date, September 22nd, 1919. One other thing I'd like to point out in the file is the cover page. Now, Susan would normally be considered alien in the United States by reason of being Canadian, but also the Chinese were treated separately as you can see, as this is the Chinese who are arriving over the border from Montreal in September 1919. And I would take all of these pages, all three of the list, plus the cover. And to give you an idea of the result here, here we have her name, her age, her father, his address. And in the second page, that she was attending Columbia University. Now, normally I would thoroughly study every column here. And I would perform this search, checking each one of the years for which I have clues about Susan's movements, 1919, 1923 and 1933. Now I'd like to show you how to navigate the card catalog. You're probably familiar with the main search page, but I like to use the card catalog. A keyword I found very helpful is the word Chinese and clicking on Canadian records because we are, after all, looking for border crossings and search. And this particular record, North Dakota and Washington Chinese passenger arrivals has been very helpful to me in my research. If your family is also in British Columbia or has origins in British Columbia and liked going to the United States, this database will be helpful to you in your research. Now I have looked for Susan in this database many times and I'm now down to two keywords, very general search, yep, and 1923. When a search doesn't come up immediately for me, I go through the entire list of results looking for people that I recognize. For example, this one, him sounds similar to one of my cousins, but there's this one, Q Yin. Q Yin is Susan's brother. And he was traveling in October, 1923. Notice that what we are looking at is immigration records tracking the movements of Chinese only 
into the United States, in this case, the Port Seattle, aboard the CPR ship Princess Charlotte. And reading all the way down the list here, Princess Charlotte, October 11, 1923, Yip Ki Yin, the person who brought us to this page, but just above him is Susan. If we had tried to search for her alone and given up, we would not have found this record. When I look at the index, here's Q Yin, but above, see, the transcription isn't very clean, and that might be a reason why her name does not show up. Now that we have travel and immigration documents from Ancestry, I'd like to take you to the next stage, looking for Chinese immigration records at Library and Archives Canada. You've got clues and information now from those records to search the database effectively. This is a great page if you haven't seen it before. It has a wealth of information. I encourage you to read everything here. For our presentation today, though, we are looking at Chinese immigration nine certificates. There's a description. Now, CI nine certificates are for Chinese who wish to leave Canada and have the right to return to the country. We know already that Susan went to Columbia in 1919. She was also a student. So Yip is a fairly safe bet for a last name. You'll see there are 75 results for Yips who wish to leave the country in 1919. You can go down to the bottom and click through and read all of them. It is interesting reading. Or you can search the filter. Notice this is Susan's Chinese name. And this is her English name. Chinese immigration certificates contain information that you will not see in many cases anywhere else. Certainly, as you saw before, the passenger lists and the indexes and the cards, they have information, but they don't have information like a CI certificate. These are very valuable to have, and I do encourage you to take the next step to look for them once you have gathered, gathered all the clues from your documents and ancestry. Aside from details such as height and weight, year of immigration, CI certificates quite often have the name in Chinese right here. You'll recall in my tip number one that I said Chinese names are very important and sometimes CI9s are where you can find them. And photos. I would perform this search for Susan for at least the three instances, 1919, 1923, and 1933. And in fact, there are four of these to find in domestic immigrants to Canada. The name says it all, I think. Okay, so now you have immigration and travel records plus who knows what else in Ancestry. You've got a Chinese immigration and nine certificates from Library and Archives Canada. The next step is to take advantage of the Chinese Exclusion Act case files and uh, see what else you can find. Now, I've shown you already the uh, records at the National Archives at Seattle. What I'd like to bring your attention to is the Chinese Family History Group of Southern California. Now, they have done an enormous amount of work 
right here, the case file index by birth country from NARA at Seattle. You can download this index on an Excel file, and I have done that. It is amazing. Excel anything is amazing. I love Excel. And from that Excel file, I have pulled two, two Chinese Exclusion Act case file numbers for Susan. The first one, uh, please note that uh, this is a, a long um, row and I've cut them in half so that you can see them better. Uh, the first one shows the box number, the case number, the name, the, uh, and then Seattle married, entry date 1933. So it looks like when Susan was leaving from uh, Canada to go back to China, she went via Seattle. And because she went via Seattle, there's an exclusion at case file for her. Now in the other one, uh, case 67711, uh, it's Susan as her uh, single uh, Yip Kim Ling before she was married. And notice it's uh, 1923. So that is probably when she and her brother Q went to Seattle uh, for the weekend. I haven't had a chance to find these case files yet, but when I do, oh, I'll be excited because, because I have this. I have an example of uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act case file from my great-grandfather who went to that expo with his family and now I have 23 pages of records, declarations, attestations, forms, photos. These are rich genealogical records to have. And Chinese genealogy is so hard. I mean, if you can get these records, you should. But of course, there's a caveat. The uh, NARA um, archives are closing at Seattle. Uh, the, uh, the, there's a fight on to preserve them where they are, but I do encourage you as soon as we are able to go to get those files out of Seattle as quick as you can. Okay. So to recap, what have we found here? From one article from newspapers.com, we found uh, a number of facts which led us to these immigration records. And I didn't stop there with that one article. I did find a number of other articles. Such as this one, 1917, Vancouver Daily World, and it talks about a picnic on uh, the Chinese Oriental, the new Oriental School, uh, three teachers, Susan, uh, M. Chen, and S.S. Chu. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, we had that passenger list uh, from 1933, uh, where Susan uh, was arriving with her two children. Uh, and we've got the border crossing when Susan was going to New York State in 1919 as a student. We've got the 1923 border crossing with her and her brother. Uh, we've also got a Washington manifest from that <clears throat> same trip. And we've got this uh, 1933 record. And where are we? Uh, <clears throat> we have Chinese immigration records from 1919, which I demonstrated earlier. We also have two from 1923. This one, which you'll recall, Susan and her brother Yin went to Seattle and Susan 
Susan went to Hong Kong in 1923. But wait, there's still more. The 1933 Chinese immigration record where Susan, who is now Madame Leung, is going to China to continue her teaching career. And so we have 15 related documents, uh, thanks to this article, and uh, who knows what we'll find in the Chinese Exclusion Act case files. Now, you'll remember I said in my tip number four, cluster research, uh, who are Susan's fan club? Uh, we know from the newspaper articles that Susan had uh, a couple of university students. We know from the other newspaper article that she had a couple of other teachers. Uh, we uh, know that she met Shanka Shak and knew him and also that uh, she had met uh, Gordon Yuen of the Chinese Nationalist League. So if I wanted to expand my areas of research, I could look for the people that knew Susan and that Susan knew to get a much greater in-depth look at her life. So to review, collect the names all the names, you'll see from this demonstration that uh, Susan went by May, she went by Ling, uh, there was Gim, uh, there was Chik Wai Lung, there was Madam Lung, oh, and then there was Susan Yip Sang, and that was just in today's webinar. I, I don't know how many other names. Uh, so collect all the names so that you will recognize the person's records when you finally find them. Um, Go to the Canadian censuses to glean immigration clues from the census data. Look at trips in and out of the country, especially the United States. Now I have focused on in this webinar on uh, the, the cross uh, state prevent province traffic between BC and uh, Washington state, but that doesn't mean that Chinese across the country didn't Cross the borders at Montreal, at Portal, North Dakota, wherever at Vermont, uh, border crossings. Border crossings are into a different country. And remember, the Chinese Immigration Act and the Chinese Exclusion Act meant that Chinese were tracked with a great deal of documents leaving the country and entering the country. Also, if you get stuck, you can track everyone business associates, neighbors, the fan club. <clears throat> and cluster research. Also, you can play what if with major events to guide your research. For example, um, one of the questions I like to ask my uh, elder relatives is, uh, what was it, did you vote? Did you vote in 1949? And what was that like for you? Also, we have the example of the AYP with Yip Sang. So for this webinar, my resources uh, are listed right here. Uh, I have an Ancestry World Edition. I, it is, uh, I started off with a Canadian edition and then once I started crossing borders, I just needed to have the, uh, the World Edition. Obviously, I've also got Newspaper Publishers Extra. It's been a huge uh, tool in my toolkit of uh, genealogy for really any kind of research, not just Chinese. Other resources that I've called on in this presentation, uh, Library and Archives Canada, uh, the narrow records, especially the ones at Seattle. Uh, also, there's this <clears throat> article that ex helps explain a lot about the um, records of immigration across the US-Canada border right up to 1954, otherwise known as the St. Albans lists. And <clears throat> although I didn't show them in this webinar. The University of British Columbia has a great resource. 
in the Chinese experience, 1850 <clears throat> to 1950. It really helps explain immigration and naturalization. Also, my site, Past Presence, I have been collecting uh, information for genealogy for years and years and years. They're here, they're for the US and Canada, everything from names to immigration dates. So after Ancestry, you could check out my site uh, for information. <clears throat> and in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to Exclusion Act case files, where I did a blog post on finding them, uh, where you can find them, how you can find them. And then I did a case study using uh, my cousin's mom, oh, my cousin's aunt. And I looked at her case file. I got it from Seattle just before the archives closed in March. So lucky timing for me. And I learned all about Eileen and her career as an actor with the Chinese showboat company. So that was amazing. There will, there's also a checklist. Uh, I've given you five top tips here uh, for Chinese genealogy. If you found that useful, uh, come on over to Past Presence and uh, come get your checklist. Okay, that is it for me. I hope that you enjoyed this webinar. I have such appreciation to everyone uh, to this point. Genealogy is certainly not something that you can do. Well, you can, you, you can do it by yourself. It's not nearly as much fun. Um, I'm a member of uh, several genealogy societies, uh, BC and Saskatchewan. I'm uh, going to join Ontario uh, because there's nothing like getting with your tribe to obsess about genealogy. <clears throat> uh, a shout out to my sister, especially because when I was first learning about Chinese genealogy, I it was pretty much self-taught and my sister was my only audience. So for acres of patience. Uh, also, I've uh, been privileged to receive uh, many uh, collections of uh, family documents and photos. That's helped my own understanding of uh, the Chinese diaspora and the history. Uh, I, I do also want to shout out to um, the, 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 the men and women of the Chinese uh, uh, community in the 1970s in Vancouver's Chinatown who revitalized uh, Chinatown. Uh, among them, my uncles, uh, Larry Chu and Garrett Chu, and uh, Carol Wong and Susanna Sito and Jim Wong Chu and that group, um, I stand on their shoulders, honestly. Last but not least, I wouldn't be here without my great grandfather Yip Sang and a huge thank you to Great Aunt Susan. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>